Well, good morning and welcome to Riverview Church Online. Great to be with you this morning. Now, this is message three of our Church Redefined series. Now, this is not about inventing a new version of church, but rather trying to redefine what it is or what it could or should be in the midst of all this kind of chaos where what we've been familiar with has kind of been swept away for a while. And message one, we looked at the foundational anchor points needed that underpin our identity as believers and as church. Message two, we looked at the church as being a building, not of bricks and mortar, but of living stones that are individually crafted and placed into the spiritual house by Jesus himself. This new temple, this new royal holy priesthood built on the foundation of the apostle and prophets teaching uh, upon the fellowship, upon the breaking of bread and upon prayer, which of course is all on the foundation of who Jesus is. Now you can catch up with those previous uh, messages in our video section on Facebook or go to our YouTube channel or even our podcast. You can get it all three of those ways. Now for months we've been doing this crazy version of church online. Our, our Sunday gatherings, our Wednesday night prayer meeting, the, the connect group, the Zoom meetings, the list goes on, etc, etc. And it seems to have produced actually some great positives, I think. For example, the, the connect group, I think, has helped us to, well, connect I mean really it's done exactly that it's helped us to be church you know Monday to Saturday as well as on the Sunday and it's wonderful to see the interactions the support the encouragements and the banter that has gone with that particularly loving the banter the, the prayer meeting engagement I think has been just phenomenal and I'm so blessed to see such a growth of confidence and a growth in maturity of those prayers that have been posted and the interactions that I've seen between all of you living stones. And then the online messages overall, I think, have had a much wider reach, even when people aren't able to connect directly between 11, kind of 35 and 12 p.m. I've no idea what's in that like number up there right now. Um, but it doesn't matter because people can catch this when they need to when they want to you can connect when you're able which is so helpful if you've got kids if you work shifts or if you've got other kind of commitments it's easy to catch up when you want to and not feel like you've missed out on church and it's perhaps less intimidating to pray in a virtual group where you're writing your prayer out and you can actually think about it before you hit send there's no need to rush out of the door at the minute. No need to puzzle over my wardrobe. No, no one cares what my hair looks like. You can watch the message, comfy sofa, mug of coffee, even in your pyjamas. And you can even preach in your pyjamas. You see, there you go. Top half only, that's all I've done today. You know, you can pause and let the dog in. You can doze off and nobody's gonna poke you unless your husband or wife is there to do that for you. If you're really bored or if you disagree with something that you hear, well, you can just switch off. I mean, literally, you've got the remote in your hand. You can do that. You have the power. Now, the question I want to ask today is how normal or familiar has this become? Uh, have we become comfortable with this to the point that the thought perhaps of regathering, I mean, in person is, is even less attractive or even uncomfortable, which perhaps it will be as we first gather with masks and all that kind of stuff. Now, don't get me wrong. I am profoundly grateful for the ways in which we've been able to connect and be church throughout all of this madness. Some of these things will also probably possibly continue, but church, there is more. There's more to this. There's more to our identity and there's more to the outworking of that identity in our lives. These things have been great for the season uh, where, where we've not been able to physically gather. But this season, in some ways and in some parts, is changing or about to change. Now, in Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 to 8, you might be familiar with this. King Solomon, the wise King Solomon, says that there is a time for 
everything, every season, every activity, everything under the sun. There's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal. There's a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, to mourn, to dance, to search, to give up, to keep or to throw away, to tear or to mend, to be silent or to speak, to love or to hate, and a time for war and a time for peace. But it's verse five that I left out actually there that really caught me following on from last week's message. And that is this, there's a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. Actually, the second part of that verse is pretty appropriate to our season right now as well. A time to embrace and a time to (laughs) refrain from embracing. Don't shake my hand. You could add to that a time to wear a face mask and a time to refrain from wearing a face mask. But here we are, a time to gather living stones and a time to scatter living stones. Today, I want to talk to you about the importance of the church being both gathered and scattered. Both are of equal importance. The church is a spiritual house built with these living stones. This house is intended to be both community minded and missionally minded, gathered and scattered, looking inwards and looking outwards. If a person only has a mind for the gathered church, like all about the meeting, all about the church community. The the danger is that either you end up with a separated kind of monastic community, perhaps safe and, and lovely and a wonderful place to be, but unengaged, actually irrelevant and devoid of power. Or it can make the church into something like an object of consumerism, like what can I get out of church? Or you might hear people say, well, that church wasn't really meeting my needs, so I left to find somewhere else. Look, both of those things lack the ability to take the seed, the the gospel, and, and, and throw it out into the society surrounding it. But on the other hand, if a person is only uh, has in mind for the scattered church, then what you end up with is individualism. Like I do Jesus my way, unable to provide discipleship or it becomes something like a, a social or political or environmental kind of activism, like a million charities that do good things, but are not gospel centred or focused, perhaps good causes, but unable to shake or shape the world around them or anything in the eternal. And as vitally important as it is that we gather together and that we're able to do that is that we are willing to be scattered together. Actually, the one resources and empowers the other, the gathering resources and empowers the scattering to be the seeds of new life and hope for the lost in this town. We, we cannot be scattered effectively unless we are gathered effectively. Now, I want to give you a brief illustration here. You see, what farmer would go out into a field where he needs to sow seed and sow his seed like this, you know, kind of like one seed at a time, just throwing it out. I mean, for for one, that would take him hours and hours. And two, the scattering would be sort of minimal, kind of piecemeal. It wouldn't actually do the job sufficiently. What the farmer will do is gather a handful and then scatter the whole thing out across the field as he goes. In fact, old farmers used to wear these bags of seed on the side that they would take and throw out and scatter so that it was covered well. You needed to gather the seed together in order to efficiently, effectively scatter it. 
both things are of equal importance. The gathered is for internal growth and development of the body, and then the scattered brings that growth to the external. You grow from the outside, you grow in number, you, you throw out seed, and that seed brings grain and fruit, development. So I want to spend a few moments this morning looking at the gathered church and then a few moments looking at the scattered church to see how they are both equally important. Important for the whole church and for you as an individual believer. So let's look at the church gathered first. And I, as we do that, there's a couple of points that I want to make. And last week we read these words in the book of Acts. It says every day. They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all people. That reference will come up on your screen. Now, my first point is this, that where we gather isn't as important as that we gather. Where we gather is not as important as the fact that we actually do gather. Yes, they met every day in the temple. They also met in their individual homes. Neither of those things is a mandate for a method or a model of what church should be in this day and age. The, the temple is not a mandate to have or own a large building. There's nothing wrong with that, but this is not a mandate for that because they did not own the temple. In fact, the guys that were going to the temple were not even welcome there. And as a result of going there daily to pray and daily proclaiming the gospel fearlessly in public, they got whipped and beaten and mocked and imprisoned for it. Now, that doesn't sound like my experience of the gathered church in this day and age in a church building. I mean, you might be thinking, well, thank goodness for that. eh? Our buildings are safe. I mean, dare I say it, even discreet, but sometimes hidden. You know, people don't really know or even understand what actually goes on in our church buildings because they can't see in. Now, perhaps what we should do together is identify what the modern temple of our society is and then gather there like en masse and proclaim the greatness and sovereignty of King Jesus. I mean, where would that be? Would it be the stadiums? Would it be the council offices? Would it be the town hall? Would it be even like something like the pubs where people gather? I mean, would you be willing when we are able to do so to gather as a church in the temple courts and the marketplaces of our generation, whatever those are? Uh, the next thing is that they used their homes extensively for meetings. And this is not a mandate for like small gathering church that used to be called house church or something like that, as being like that is the only authentic expression of church, which I've heard before. But actually, this demonstrates further that these guys had all things in common. The fact that they used their homes, that their homes were open houses, open places where they gathered daily shows that they had everything open to the body. What is mine is not my own. And so in these two things, the temples and in the homes, there was this diversity of location in the gatherings, not restricted to one place and not hidden. And that was a real key here. As the gathered church, we can use the resources that we already have in order to push out into the community, even when we're not exactly welcomed there. And I tell you, doing church like that, it will be uncomfortable, but we cannot afford to cling to the comfortable at the expense of the community. My second point here is that they didn't consider a compartmentalised version of the church, like this is mine, this is God's, this is mine, this is the church's. No, they met every day, every day, and they had all things in common. They didn't see resources like this is what I give to God and then this is what I keep 
for me. They didn't see kind of like this is my career life and then this is my church life or this is my church day, like Sunday is his, <laughs> you know, Saturday is my family day and Monday, well, that's that's my me time day. The church is who we are, not what we do and not where we go. The church is who we are. Christianity is not meant to be compartmentalised in our lives, like what's secular and what's sacred. Like as long as I go to church on Sunday, I can do my own thing during the week. That's not Christianity. When we filter or pigeonhole our Christianity, it's not Christianity at all. God is to become to us and in us our all in all everything. The third point here is that if that's true, that God is all in all, if believers have the mindset that he is our all in all, then the gathering empowers and equips the scattering. Listen to what the writer of the book of Hebrews says. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And listen to this, not giving up in meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. So I'm sure we get this. I'm sure we understand it, but let's just underline it to make sure the gathered church is important. It is vital and actually, as we've seen from that text, it is imperative. It is mandated in scripture that we gather. It's important because it resets our focus, like from ourselves and our circumstances, back onto Jesus, back onto who he is, literally putting things back into perspective. And that's an eternal perspective. Meeting together also unifies us in worship and in communion. We have the same spirit, the same heart, the same desire, the same focus, the same hope. It also equips us, it literally disciples us to be together. It challenges us, it corrects us, it instructs us through the teaching of the word and through prayer and through the laying on of hands, which is actually completely impossible to do when we are separate and in our separate homes. And then finally, it encourages us, it builds us up. It reminds us that we are not our own. And that we are not on our own. We're part of a body. We're part of a family, a community. We belong to each other. We are together. And because of that, we are church. We're designed to be in a community, in a family. And he is the one who sets the lonely in a family. That is the church. We share this. To take what has been imparted in the gathered, the church, and we take that out into the world, into our community as we are scattered. What we gain, what we have imparted to us in the gathering, we take out as we are scattered. The gathering empowers and equips us for scattering. It literally fuels it. So let's now consider the church scattered. Like, let's see what it looks like as the early church is scattered. And in Acts 8, 4 to 8, it says this, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, Impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralysed or lame were healed. And so there was great joy in that city. Oh, guys, the 
Wouldn't we love to see and say that there was great joy known in Bowness, that salvation was ringing out in the streets, that springs of life and that wells of living water were opening up throughout the town. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that fulfill our heart's desire for this town? And how is that possible? Well, the scattered preached the word wherever they went. Not just the leaders, not the professional evangelists, not those who just had enough confidence, but all believers, the church scattered throughout and unable to shut up about this good news, unable to do anything but radiate the presence of Jesus and demonstrate the Spirit's power. Listen carefully, believer, the presence of Jesus is taken with you where you go. You take the spiritual building of the church into your workplace, into the supermarket, the petrol station, cafes and restaurants, into the swimming pool and the gym when they're open again, on the bus, on the ferry, on the plane, to your holiday destination, everywhere you go, you take the presence of the great I am with you. And we are meant to be heard. Salvation is by hearing. The word of God is meant to be upon our lips. We're meant to be visible. What happens on the inside should be seen clearly on the outside. So I want to put this to you. To be scattered means to be church inside out. To be inside out means that what we are in the building is the same as what we are outside of the building in the street. That how we act on a Sunday is the same as how we behave on a Tuesday. How we act with believers is the same as how we act with unbelievers. To be inside out means to be missionally minded. All of us, every member, every single living stone. To be missional requires that we see beyond the gathered and are willing to be scattered. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to do, like do more, like some false religions that will count the number of doors that you've knocked upon. To be inside out actually means that we hunger for the lost, that we cry and that we weep for them, that we weep for the town, that we are hungry to see salvation here and we plead for them. Like through history, Much time has been spent in prayer where our desire is to get people inside the building rather than making it our mission to meet people where they are. Lord, give me a heart for the lost. As long as we can get them through the doors, if only they would come to church, Lord, bring them in. Well, there's nothing really wrong with those prayers and keep praying them. Uh, But as long as it's not a substitute for being missionally minded. Are we prepared to go? Are we prepared to be inside out? To be inside out means we don't walk on by. The true church should be church inside and out, Sunday and every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, every member, every living stone. So as I start to pull this together, I want to show you an incredible example of this. So let's go together to Acts 3, 1 to 10. I'm not going to stay here long, but I just want to show you this. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. 
Taken him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognised him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now look, it's on their way to the temple, outside of the temple that Peter and John were stopped. And their response was not, sorry, mate, we're late for church or we're late for a meeting. I've got to set the piano up. And neither was it to try to cajole him into the building before dealing with him. Let's just get him on the inside. They met him where he was, they dealt with him where he was, and they were ready and willing and prepared with confidence and compassion. They took the temple to him. And yet, before Peter and John came along, this man had been there every single day. For the goodness knows how long, long enough that the people were able to recognise him. They knew who he was. They walked on by every single day. Every day visible. They're in sickness and in desperate poverty, going to the only place where he hoped to find healing, the only place where he should have found care and compassion, and yet finding a people who were more concerned with their own sense of religious righteousness. The people in the temple were so focused on protecting their traditions on the inside that they missed the need outside that was right on their doorstep. And that was never what God wanted. It grieved him so much. And as we saw last week, he is building a new spiritual house, a new temple, a new holy and royal priesthood that is there to meet this need. We actually see these two temples at work in contrast in that passage we've just read. What we see is the external overflow of what is happening on the inside of these two temples as it becomes the action, as it becomes that or the lack thereof on the outside of those temples. Look, the old temple, it has become cold and lifeless on the inside and so has nothing to give on the outside. Consumed with legalism, values rule over relationship and is more comfortable in ceremony rather than in compassion for the community. The new temple, on the other hand, this temple of living stones is overflowing with life, housing the Holy Spirit himself and in great demonstration of power, bringing hope and life to the lost and the sick and the forgotten and the sinful. The hope that we have needs to be obvious to cause people to ask for the hope that we have. And when they ask, we should be prepared to answer with all gentleness and respect. Guys, we are church. We carry the hope of Jesus' gospel for this community inside and outside of the building, gathered and scattered, together and separately. So as I close, that what we are on the inside will always affect what we do on the outside. The gathering impacts the scattering. A church that exists entirely behind closed doors for the sole purpose of meeting for its own comfort and benefit, well, that's not the church. And we can't afford to cling to the comfortable at the expense of the community. If we are church on the inside, as God intends, then we will be church on the outside. But conversely, if we're not church on the outside of the building, then we'll never be church inside the building. You may feel as though you have nothing to give. Silver or gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Can you give what you do have? in his name. We're to be a visually present church. We're we're not meant to be hidden. We're not meant to be silent. We are meant to be purposeful like salt and visible like light. And that is where we're going to pick this up next week. Bless you. Amen.